Welcome to this discussion on hydroponic systems, defining those types, and identifying the major systems used in commercial production. Hydroponic production presents a unique set of issues soil-based production does not. So we will look into key problems and products that will help solve production issues in hydroponic systems. Let's go to basics and define what a hydroponic system consists of. If you currently use soil, you may be surprised how many types of hydroponic systems there are, and once invested, how much easier it is to grow using hydroponics over soil-based systems. One of the main attributes of a hydroponic system and what makes it ideal for urban production is the constant reuse of the water used to produce their crop. Environmental regulators have been targeting controlled environmental production as a point source for pollutants. We'll discuss how to keep that water clean in a closed recycling system, and then how that system can be used in urban areas as well as in normal production areas. Ebb and flood tables can be used in both hydroponic and soil-based systems. Simply stated, plants absorb water through the curiously called drain holes in the container as the bench fills from the bottom up with water from the reservoir. In this way, no irrigation water ever touches the plant's foliage, which is a plus for disease prevention. But because you're growing in a greenhouse, you have high humidity and you still have wet plants, which can have uh, foliar leaf issues. Vertical growing systems are the rage in urban areas where space is expensive and minimal for growing. More of the greenhouse space is being utilized, lowering the overall cost of production. As in this image, pots are being used with drip lines dosing each container from the bottom to the top. Goli or tray systems contain the water that plants absorb and no media is used whatsoever. The covers around the plants and the trays themselves keep the roots in a dark environment and so they remain healthy. Plants may move across the range as they mature, starting in one end as a plug and at the other end ready to harvest. Once they reach the other side, they are moved into another cycle and a continuously rotation process of trays keeps the crop moving across the greenhouses. The floating raft systems is similar to the tray system, except you have more plants floating literally on top of a bed of water. Uh, so you see the difference between the goalie trays. Uh, they are not uh, self-contained units, but they are all sharing the same area. The open pot system mimics soil-based production the most. Change the media and you change the process. In this case, an organic or inorganic media is used just to stabilize the plant. And each pot is fed from a main irrigation line with emitters placed in each pot. This resembles outdoor production of any standard nursery more than any other hydroponic system that we're showing today. Nutrient film is similar to raft systems, only that the roots here are in contact with a thin film of water versus the raft system in which their roots are sitting in a bath of water. Unlike the first vertical system we discussed, these tower systems don't have individual pots. They're just in one tube and the tubes are fed from the irrigation uh, reservoir at the base of the tube system. And then they're fed again from a uh, reservoir from the fertility area where the fertilizers are injected. And this system has continuously recycled the water. Uh, again, this is a uh, process that's used in highly uh, condensed urban areas where space is a uh, minimum and a very expensive. Uh, but harvesting crops like this is a little more difficult than the original vertical systems discussed at the beginning. Plant roots are established in the soilless media substrates or floated in water that permit the flow of the sustaining plant solutions. In this case, the one of the original materials used for rooting 
and uh, holding the plants is rock wool, which is an organic fibrous material from the molten slag byproduct of steel production. They come in multi-developed uh, sizes and micro plugs and in small blocks that are packaged, large blocks which are packaged and self-sustaining and pre-dibbled for your drip line systems, plus the original slabs which were basically put into a gutter or tray system and grown the uh, tomatoes and uh, other vegetables in the major greenhouse operations for controlled environmental production of food crops. Now, contrary to the inorganic slag previously, peat moss by itself is organic decayed moss grown usually in boggy grounds and harvested uh, and packaged and sent to growers across the country. Uh, this again is just being used as a, a place for the roots to be established and the hydroponic fluids would flow through and around this material as the plants are anchored. The next material is core, which is basically the husks of a coconut. And uh, contrary to some of the other materials as an organic product, this really lasts a very long time. Uh, so you see the media is fine and fibrous. There's pore space there. Again, it's a great growing media for hydroponic plant material. The next material is, is similar to the rock one that it's an organic based material, perlite. Uh, it's obsidian rock formed from volcanic glass and it does not break down. So uh, originally this product was used to uh, amend soil that uh, plant material was grown in because it does retain its shape and increases the aeration of the soil. But with hydroponics, you could just grow plants directly in this since all the nutritional materials are being flowed across the plant with the irrigation system. Pine bark started out as a waste product from paper mills in the South, free for the taking. Like perlite, it was used as a component in soil-based growing, but it too has moved into a 100% pure rooty base for hydroponic production. The benefits are root attachment, water flow, and a long life in the container. No longer free as a waste product from the wood milling, it remains a very common mainstay for growing today. So let's go to the water now. Controlling all aspects of water used in hydroponics provides a consistency because now you have a known pH, you know what your alkalinity is, you know what the mineral content is, as well as addressing any environmental toxins, nutrients, and other total dissolved solids that are in that water source. So if you're using well water, you have some issues with the mineral content. If you're using city water, you have issues with the pH levels. And if you're using surface water, like ponds or rivers, you can have bottled weeds and seeds, as well as other pest insects and diseases in there. So how do you start off with a good water system? I will say that you need to start off with a reverse osmosis treatment of that water, which removes all the impurities, organic as well as inorganic, and provides you with a uh, base water system to now you can manipulate. So back to your basics in plant production, the minimal nutrients requirements to be present for the plant are listed here. These 16 elements are those, but uh, you will focus on the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium as the macronutrients versus the minor nutrients of the rest of the materials there. So being able to start with a water that you know the uh, content and, and its reaction to uh, adding nutrients to it is the basis for hydroponics being successful. And again, this is with a recycling system where you're using the water over and over and over again. So now you're dealing with fertility with this basic water, with, which is clean of nutrients. So you wanna work with nitrogen levels, usually between 76 to 150 parts per million depending on the stage of growth of the plant and phosphorus levels remain relatively constant throughout the life of the system. 
potassium levels will range between 120 to 150 parts per million. And illustrated to the right of that are four dosing systems or injectors if you want to use either one of those. And you would probably have various different nutrient levels in there and potentially uh, moving down, you would have acid to inject into your water to modify the pH to between 5.8 to 6.0. And the acid bases to use for that would be sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid, and nitric acid. All those are available and are used in our industry, but phosphoric acid by far is the most popular. So once you get the water and you're working with it, you need to keep it in the recycled system. And the critical systems to enhance pest management include things like ozone generators, where water can be recycled through the production area and then ozonated with the generator, which oxidizes everything that's in the water, both organic and uh, biologic. And that really purifies the water system. So it kills the organic and adds oxygen into the system, which is an added plus for the plant and the root development. And the other alternative to taking care of some of these organic materials is the ultraviolet light systems. Again, these two take care of a lot of uh, the organic material that might be inside the water lines uh, with the radiation on the ultraviolet light systems will damage the cellular integrity of whatever little nasty might be in the water. So using either or or both of these systems will purify your water. All right, now getting into the base of the discussion is how to prevent and control diseases and insects in hydroponic systems. First and foremost, for any type of competent grower are controlling those variables and which you can do specifically with cultural practices as the beginning point. This preparation is making sure that the inoculum of whether the insect or disease problem is, is not present or minimized and why growing area sanitation is your cheapest investment uh, for being on plan with your production. Clean every surface, bench, sidewall, floor with a commercial quaternary salt or oxidizing agent. Secondly, you want to start with clean stocks. So you either produce your own stock or you buy in and quarantine those stock plants or plugs before you introduce them into the growing area to make sure that you can identify any disease or insect issue before you introduce it to the rest of the greenhouse. And then lastly, in this discussion, make sure that your root media is clean, as previously mentioned, and not carrying insect eggs or pathogens from the previous crop. If everything that can be done to prevent issues is complete, disease and insect control is an easier process. Every insect that is encountered in the soil-based pro production process is present in a hydroponic system as well. Using IPM scouting, crops daily, and using sticky cards, you can plan the use of crop protection products, which has been classified as reduced risk, chemically based pesticides that provide a quick kill or a long-term suppression, but used correctly can be of no impact to the environment. This is up to you as a grower to follow and use the label as, as designed. If done so, the impact in the hot environment is zero. Read the label. Biorationals are still chemical compounds with a shorter term of efficacy and they are totally non-toxic to the environment as defined. Biological materials are non-chemical in nature, but retain pesticidal activity either through infection with a fungus or a nervous system disruptor or a parasite process. Today, most branded products have a targeted impact on specific pests and a half-life from just a few days through a few months at the most. These are classified as reduced risk pesticides by the EPA and include products as listed on this table. Even within specific pesticidal classes, there's a wide gamut of use and duration. In one case, neonicotinoids are non-toxic to mammals, as in flea protection for domestic pets, 
and they have a short-term environmental effect except for the first label product of imidacloprid. But dinotefiron is a fast-acting drench material and used properly in a greenhouse production is gone from the plants before they leave for market. The same is true of acetamidprid cleaning up any issue just prior to shipping where is where it shines. Spirotetramat and pyrapoxifen are two alternatives and needed products for resistance management. There are insect specific products for like Lepidoptera and mites. These examples demonstrate that depending on crops grown, very good reduced risk products are available and make up the majority of products used in pest management and production. Bridging the gap between traditional chemical controls and biological products are the biorationals. These are the products that are, are naturally occurring pesticides generally, or fungi or hybrids, some of which are not listed as biorational by the EPA, but are considered birational by other experts in the field. Again, there is a broad spectrum of coverage, insect life stage products, which ultimately disrupt the populations to an acceptable level for production. Pyrethrin is a highly toxic material and a quick knockdown product, most active one in this group. Most work best as preventive though, with a slower controlling process. Beneficial insects have gained use and require a dedication to this process to be effective in any greenhouse operation. As with any biological program, the pest must be present for the predator to survive creating a lag control or a reduced percentage of control. Biological companies have addressed this with the ability to supply growers with more control insects for release once an issue has been found. IPM is critical to be able to economically react to the crop needs and must be addressed on a regular basis. Disease concerns focus on a root zone since they are continuously bathed in a wash of water. Starting with propagation as the plugs develop, a prophylactic application of the listed fungicides can be used to prevent disease development. Because we're working in an aquaculture, the possibility of transmitting any disease is high through the irrigation systems. So let's take a quick look at organic solutions with products that may have OMRI certification for food production. These products are limited in their control aspects, but can be used with biological controls to fortify their efficacy. This works in soil as well as hydroponic productions. And again, just read and follow the directions. These examples are what New Farm provides and other uh, companies provide a list of materials that fit the organic solutions list. So back to focusing on hydroponics in food crops, most companies that produce products used on consumables will have a specific list, which with other manufacturers will help the production planner be successful with their crops. So again, we need to decide which type of hydroponics suits your site, perform the cultural practices we mentioned earlier to reduce the infestation before you start. Then you move on to using nutrients that provide the best result without overstimulating the plant to increase the susceptibility to infection or insect infestation. Keep the growing areas clean and the water use clean and sanitized. Water is the source of everything in this system. Use plant protection chemicals and biologicals that fit the crop's needs, depending on the crop that you're growing. Prevent problems rather than cure issues. So let's summarize where we are so far. We've covered what hydroponics is, the various types in the discussion, and how to prepare for a crop that includes sanitation, uh, any types of plant protection materials you need, the fungicides, insecticides, or the biologicals or the biorationals, and what to look for during production to have a successful crop. Everything we've touched on is contained in the following short video on hydroponic herb production. Be sure to note the water purification system, the injectors, the automated moving racks that begin as a plug on one end, and our finished crops at the other end. 
Thanks again for taking time to review our discussion on hydroponic systems and how they work, what products you can use to protect your plants in the production system, and the types of hydroponic systems that are available in the marketplace.